Hi, I'm Richard Rogers, and I absolutely hope that you enjoy today's spiritual message. You know, we at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center are committed to helping people live better lives. We're going to provide you tools over and over, spiritual tools, that allow you to live your best possible life. And if you want to leave a donation, just continue to allow the work that we do to support other people just like you, we say thank you. Thank you for your generosity, because this ministry is committed to making the world a better place. So, how many of you have enjoyed playing Game On in the last 30 days? I have. I have loved it. I mean, how many of you have exercised more in the heat because of Game On than you might have done on your own? Anybody? I have. I, I put in, and, and I love it. I mean, it, you, you get up, and I had a woman a couple weeks ago, she called out Richard and I and, on Facebook like on a Thursday morning, and she said, I got up a half an hour early. My ministers better be up exercising because they, and it was one of those times it was the grace of God. I just finished my hike over in the McDowell Mountains, and I had a picture of my dog and I on our hike, so I actually had proof that I had done it, right? And so... I have loved this, right, because, because it's the whole thing. It's physical, it was mental, it was emotional, and it's spiritual, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. So one of the things that, that has become so obvious in this process is that the more that we exercise, the more that that touches every area of our life. I mean, the brain research is astronomical that exercise impacts mental health, but also brain function. Um, exercise impacts emotions and how we feel. And I'm gonna suggest tonight that it also impacts our spiritual life, that we feel better spiritually when we're fit. And then the second week, we really focused on the brain and what, what happens in the brain, but not only on the biology of it, we also focused on thought management and how to really begin to control what's the thoughts that we're thinking over and over again. And what I suggested for you is that we come up with five statements. I call them your power statements. Five statements that you go to over and over again. So when your mind starts to go south, does anybody else's mind go south? When your mind, you start falling into self-doubt, you have your power statements, you keep coming back to your power statements because your affirmations, your five power statements are really the basis of what you want to create. And then last week was about the emotions. And, and what I really challenged you to look at was emotional fitness, I define it as our ability to be happy no matter what's going on around us, right? Because it's easy to be happy when everything's working. And I really challenge you to look at what is your ability to be happy all the time, right? Because that's really fitness. When you're emotionally fit, you really have control over your own level of happiness. And you can actually do higher and higher levels of happiness because you're emotionally fit. When we don't feel emotionally fit, then emotionally we're all over the place. How many of you have ever felt emotionally out of shape? Like emotionally, you're just all over the place and you're, you're not in control and it feels crazy and it's not easy. But the moment you start being responsible for your own happiness, everything in your life begins to change, really change. Because really the purpose, as I shared in class on Monday night, the purpose of life, your purpose is to be happy. Like if you've ever wondered what your purpose is, your purpose is to be happy. And, and being happy requires that you be in integrity with yourself, right? And so when we look at happiness as our life purpose, life gets to be a lot more fun. How many of you thought your life purpose was going to be hard, right? It's just be happy, right? As a spiritual being, be happy. And now today we get to talk about, we get to talk about spiritual fitness, you know, so I'd like you to drop down and give me 20 spiritual push-ups, right? Because it's a little confusing. Like mentally, emotionally, even physically, it's a little bit more tangible. So what does it mean when you're spiritually fit, right? Because in some ways of thinking, like in some churches, they really believe that we're broken. 
And if you believe that people are broken, then spiritual fitness kind of makes a little bit more sense because then you're going to try to get yourself right or you're going to try to get the people around you right. And, and you're broken and you're a sinner and you're terrible and you're awful. And so when you finally get yourself right, that feels like spiritual fitness. But what is fitness if you're whole and complete and lacking in nothing? What, if, what is fitness if you're created in the image and likeness of God? What does fitness mean to you then? And I'd like to suggest tonight that fitness is, is really the same. Like physical fitness, your muscles, your ligaments, your organs, you were designed that way. And physical fitness is just about using what you have. Emotional fitness it's about using your ability to be happy. Mental fitness is using your mind in the most productive way to create the life that you want. And what I'd like to suggest today is that spiritual fitness is just that. It's your ability to access your spirit in ways that are the most meaningful to move your life forward. Spiritual fitness, ideally, is your ability to feel God, to live feeling connected to the presence and power that is within you and all around you. And, and when we're not spiritually fit, we feel isolated and alone. We feel like God is somewhere else, but he's left. Has everybody had that feeling once or twice in their life? where you feel like if there is a God, he, he's moved to Cleveland because he is not here, right? Because there is no God in my world. There is no God in my life. And what I really want you to see is that spiritual fitness is that when you live a life where you feel deeply, profoundly connected to your relationship with God and that sometimes it actually requires work on our part. Is that true? Right, Because some of the things that we're doing really are not helpful to deepening and broadening our spiritual relationship with the divine. It's just not helpful. And as we begin to do and make new choices, we get to feel more and more connected, more and more inspired, more and more alive with God. So tonight what I want to share with you is four of the aspects that I think are a sign of spiritual fitness so that you actually know when you're getting there, right? Because with this one, if you don't really kind of have some benchmarks, you know, because you're not going to go out and run a spiritual mile. Well, some of us have run a lot of spiritual miles, right? But what are the things that we can begin to look for in our own life to see if we're really as spiritually fit as we'd like to be? So the first one. First one I want to talk to you about tonight is, is love. And, and love really is, for me, the most important way of really discerning my own spiritual fitness. That, that my ability to love and to love freely and to receive love really is a sign of how connected I feel to God. In, in the gospel, of first, in 1 John's 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. So one of the things I want you to look at in your own spiritual fitness, especially as it relates to love, is how much of your time are you spending feeling afraid? Afraid of life, afraid of God, afraid that things aren't going to turn out. How much time are you spending in fear? Because one of the ways that we feel the most, when we feel distant from God, one of the, the symptoms of that is that we tend to live in a great deal of fear. We have fear and anxiety about everything. There's so much fear when we feel distant or separate from God. If we don't feel worthy of God, if we don't feel worthy of the blessings of God, if we don't feel deeply, profoundly connected with God, there is an immense amount of anxiety. That Anxiety medications are one of the leading prescriptions that are going on in the world today. And what I want you to see today is if you're feeling anxious, I want you to open your heart. 
Jesus said the most important thing was to love the Lord your God with all your mind, your heart, your soul. And then he said the second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. I really want you to begin to practice in the presence of your anxiety, in the presence of your fears, I want you to practice love. Like, well, Richard, if I'm scared, I don't want to open my heart. Have you ever had that experience? That when you're scared, what you really want to do, right, what, what seems like the most normal, the most appropriate thing to do is to close your heart. And then when your heart's closed, how much can you actually feel anything other than your own fear? You can't. So now that the moment you've closed your heart, what you've done is permanently locked, not permanently, but significantly locked in the fear that you're feeling in your heart, and there's nothing there at that point to wash it away. There's nothing there to heal you because your heart's closed. And what if in the moment you feel the most anxious, the most afraid, you practice opening your heart to loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and it's like, no, I want to run away and hide. I want to crawl underneath the covers, pull them over my head. I don't want to love. Perfect love casts out fear. So when you are the most afraid, I'm going to challenge you to open your heart and love God more. And I guarantee that the times when you are the most afraid, I know that you can think of one or two other people in your life who your love would make a difference. And all I want you to do is send them love. I want you to practice loving God and pick one or two people in your life you know are going through something and I want you to love him. And I want you to see that you cannot be in the act of loving and be afraid at the same time, right? Because let me just kind of break it down a little bit more, right? So when you're afraid, are you in your head or in your heart? You're in your head, right? So when you're afraid, there's a story that's going on. There's a, a creativity, there's a drama, there's a, there's a chaos, there's a confusion that you've created in your mind. So. And as long as we live up here, right, there's, there's no anecdote. There's no solution. We just are running around, running around in our scared little thoughts. But the moment we shift down into our heart and begin to open our heart and begin to let the infinite love of God flow, it's like we've now shifted out of the problem area and into the solution. So does everybody have an area in your life where you know that you get anxious about? Right? Right? So what I want you to begin to see is, oh, that's the very place where I'm supposed to practice loving more. That's the place. That instead of being in my head and my fears and all my stuff, my stories, my drama, I shift to my heart and I see if I open my heart all the way, if perfect love does cast out fear. So what's the practice that I want you to do for this? Because I get 20 minutes. I get 20 minutes of every day. So I, out of that 20 minutes of every day that I'm going to challenge you to practice, practice, I want you to spend a few moments every day, a few moments, practice opening your heart. Especially when you're your most anxious. When you're your most anxious, instead of going into it and going into your drama and going into your story, I want you to just take a breath. And see if you can open your heart and just practice loving God. And then if another person, another child of God, a family member, a friend, somebody you see on TV, whatever. Like there's some people on TV that need more love. <laughs> just saying, right? Then you might just send them more love. And see if you just calm down. Because perfect love casts out fear. So the first sign of spiritual fitness is the ability to love. Now, the second one. The second aspect of spiritual love is peace. In John 16, 33, we read, Have I not said to you that in me you will have peace? In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Okay, so the point that Jesus is trying to make is that peace doesn't come when everything is just right. True? What he said was, in the world there's tribulation. Like he's saying stuff happens, right? 
But he said, in the world there's tribulation, but be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. So in the presence of feeling connected to God, does your peace go up or does your peace go down? Uh, so if you feel connected to God, if you feel like the presence of God is within you and all around you, if you feel like you're walking in the grace and the light of God, does your peace go up or down? Up. Like one of the things that's always amazed me is the people that have been in like in unity or AA or really done their spiritual practice for a long time, right? Because when they've really done their spiritual practice for a long time, there, there's just this profound peace, Right? Because peace, there's, a, there's this thing about peace where that you have to learn how to let go. People that have done their spiritual work year after year after year for a long time, they actually intentionally let go every day. Like they let go of all the details of their life every day. They turn things over to God over and over again every day. And what happens is as you learn to let go, as you learn to surrender at that level over and over and over again, you build your spiritual muscle to there's profound peace in you. Like in the world, there's tribulation. Jesus, you know, the, remember the story where Jesus was on the boat, right, and his disciples, and I love this story because his disciples were really fishermen. They, I mean, they, they lived on the water, right? So when they thought they were going to die, they were going to die. Like, they were not exaggerating the situation. They, they would not be like me. I would be, right, I'd be like, uh, get me out of here, Jesus, right? Forget about cutting my hair. Get me out of here. <laughs> You know, you know, they, 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 they would have been freaked out, right? Because they knew they were going to die. And Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. That his peace was so clear that even storms obeyed him. But you don't get to that place until you practice surrendering over and over and over again. So what is the thing that you need to surrender to get to peace? And I know we love our little human dramas. You know, we love to try to manipulate our lives to get it exactly the way we want it. And what would you have to surrender today to get to peace? And what if your peace is a sign of your spiritual maturity? That you can worry and fret all you want but you're stuck in a level of life's drama that's not always helpful. So tonight, what would you have to let go of to get to peace? And can you see that peace is important in your spiritual life? That you don't have to have it, but the people that are really living their spiritual lives, if you look at them, they know peace. Three. I think the third aspect of really being spiritually fit is understanding our ability to create. Do you know what the first story in the Old Testament is? Anybody? I know somebody knows this first story in the Old Testament. And God created heaven and earth, right? Thank you, Elizabeth. I don't know what Sunday school you went to, but I'm so glad you did, right? <laughs> the rest of you, where you been, right? Right? So the first story in the Old Testament is the story of when God created the heavens and the earth, right? And what I want you to see is that the first story in the Bible is about creation. Like, is that important? I think so. Like, you could have told another story. But the very first story is the cosmology of how God created the heavens and the earth because creation is a gift that God has given each and every one of us, that we are co-creators with God. And part of knowing our spiritual fitness is knowing our spiritual ability to create. Reading from Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. By faith we understand that the, word, the world was created out of the word of God so that what is seen is made out of the things that do not yet appear. 
So the invisible creates the physical. True? Right? So as we hold anything in consciousness, as we have faith, knowing that only good and only God is coming into our lives, then we create a world of peace and joy and abundance because it is our right to create. Is that true? So is creation your right? Right? So because you're a child of God, God has given you the God power of creation. Now, you never have to use it. You can create unconsciously every day of your whole life. You can wonder why this showed up or that showed up. You can feel a victim to this situation or that situation. You never have to consciously use your gift of the ability to create. But what I want you to see, that when we get more and more spiritually fit, we begin to take more and more responsibility for what we create in our life. We take 100% responsibility for what we create in our life. I take 100% responsibility for what I create in my life. Will you say that with me? I take 100% responsibility for what I create in my life. That I created it. And if I don't like it, if I'm not loving it, who created it? I did. And I don't care what you think about it. What I care about is does it fully express the spirit of God in me? Does it fully express the best, the highest, the most wonderful part of me? That's what I'm committed to. And that's what I want you to be committed to in your life. Like where are you not taking responsibility for your creation? Where do you want to tell yourself that you're a victim to circumstance? And what if tonight, as part of your own spiritual fitness, you were willing to take responsibility for everything in your life, that I am 100% responsible for my creation. I create. The Spirit of God creates through me. So you never have to. You can blame everybody else. You can blame circumstances or the economy or this person or that person. And you know, someplace you had parents, you can always blame them. But at some level of your life, you have to just decide. I am 100% responsible for what I create. Will you say it with me one more time? I am 100% responsible for what I create. One more time, just for grins. I am 100% responsible for what I create. If I'm not loving it, who, who gets to change it? I do. If I'm not loving my life, I am 100% empowered to change it because the moment I was given breath, the moment I was an idea in the mind of God, I was given the right to create and the expectation that I would even if I did it unconsciously, even if I did it poorly, even if I created drama and one mess after another, God believed in me enough that God gave me the ability to create so that I could know myself the way God knows me. I am 100% responsible for what I create. Will you say that with me one more time? I am 100% responsible for what I create. Now the fourth, and this is the final one. So the first one was love, the second one was peace, the third one is creation, and the fourth one is transcendence. Oh, Richard, what does that mean? I want to read you a quote. To transcend means to exist above and independent from, to rise above, to surpass, to succeed. By definition, God is the only truly transcendent being. The Lord God Almighty in Hebrews, El Shaddai, created all things of earth, beneath the earth and heaven above, and yet he exists above and independent from them all. All things are upheld by his mighty power, Hebrews 1.3. Yet he alone is above them all. The whole universe exists for him and for him that he may receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. Okay? So, th that, so I want you just to hear that, right? So God is transcendent of the creation. Is that true? So that God is bigger than what God has created. Is that true? Right? So God, does God get involved and worry about your drama? Why? 
because God is transcendent, right? So God knows it's all going to work out in the end, so God doesn't get too much involved and freak out when you're having your freak out moment, right? Because God's got you. Let the life is eternal. God sees that there, knows the plan. God's got you, right? So part of well, how we understand God is that God is transcendent. Now, what we know to be true is that what God is, I am. Is that true? That what God is, I am. So all the qualities of God, everything God is, is an aspect of me because I was created in the image and likeness of God. That I can't be separate from my creator. I'm an expression of my creator, right? So part of this job is knowing that your job is to be transcendent or your job is to be bigger than the details of your life. And this is where we get hooked, right? And, and the reason that I wanted to break this away from peace is that I want you to see that your soul needs to experience transcendency. It needs to know that it is bigger than all the drama, all the details, all the, the, all the little things that are going on in your life. And that over and over and over again, what I want you to see is that we need experiences of transcendency. That's why meditation is so important. Because when you meditate, when you close your eyes, when you turn within, when you go into your own soul, do you disconnect from all the details of your life? Hopefully, if you do it right, right? There's a point in our meditation life where, you know, we think the thought, oh, did I leave the iron on? Right? And then we get up and check the iron. Right? And what I want you to see is that if that's our meditation life, then we haven't achieved a high level of transcendency because we haven't really learned to disconnect yet from life. The part of our job as a spiritual being is to be in the world but not to be of it. And transcendency is that when you learn to let go and to see it from a space. You know, mindfulness meditation really is about creating a space in your thinking so that you can think your thoughts and notice there's a part of you that's observing your thoughts that doesn't actually have to participate in those thoughts, that can just observe them as if somebody else is watching you think, that we have this need for transcendency. We have this need to shift from being in the experience to being above it. And that's why I encourage you to spend some of the 20 minutes on, on spiritual fitness in meditation, not even in prayer, but in pure meditation where your job over and over again in meditation is just to disconnect, is to practice over and over again just letting it go. Oh, I have that thought, but I am not that thought. I have that feeling, but I am not that feeling. I have that experience, but I am more than that experience over and over again to practice disconnecting from life. Paul said, I must die daily. Like, does that sound like a happy thought? It actually is a very happy thought, right? Because it, unless we're practicing dying daily, unless we're practicing actually disconnecting, we're going to go into life thinking that this is all it is. And when a soul feels trapped that this is all there is, we miss the whole greater experience of God. That you didn't come for this. You came to experience God in the midst of this. You came to, to actually experience the face of God in the very details of our life. You know, so much of Buddhism right now, the practice of Buddhism right now, is the idea of carrying water and chopping wood. That, that in the simple acts of life, we are called to transcend to higher ground. But as part of the Christian tradition, that's just as there. It's also part of our tradition, is that we can look at the everyday acts of life and see that we're not just to do them, but we're actually there to pray without ceasing. We're actually there to be in the experience of God not just involved in the drama of the details. Now, have you ever just been tired of your own drama? Right, where you've just gotten to the point where you can't even take yourself seriously anymore? It's in those moments where your soul wants to know its transcendency. Where you need to go to the, back up to the mountain and look for as far as you can see and realize that you're not here to live a little life. You're not here to get involved in all of your drama. 
You're actually here to know God. That the number one sign of somebody who's truly spiritually fit is that they have these mystical, magical, wonderful moments where they experience God over and over and over again. There was a time when Jill and I were on a trip and we'd gotten some food and I had been driving for a while and, and it was her turn to drive and so I, <laughs> I'm not a very good co-pilot, um, but I had all the food and I put it on top of the car, right? We, we, had the, we had the inside of the sunroof. The sunroof was closed, but we had the inside open so that you could see through the, the thing. So I've got all of our food on the top of a car, right? The drinks, the food, all, everything's on top of the car. And I'm sitting in, I'm buckling in. She's getting ready to drive. And I'm, I'm a terrible, did I mention I'm a terrible co-pilot? So I get in and buckle up, and, I'm, and, sh, and Jill says, um, where's the food? I don't know, what did I do with it? <laughs> and she said, look up. And I, and I look up through the sunroof, and I see our whole dinner up there, right? <laughs> right? And there's times in life where we get so involved in what we're doing that we just forget to look up. We just forget to look up. Because we think if we take our eye off our drama, our drama's going to get us. And the moment we look up, we begin to see God again. And somehow it all works. All right? So, so I get 20 minutes. 20 minutes a day where you disconnect from your drama and you completely plug into God. 20 minutes a day where you practice opening your heart even when you don't want to. 20 minutes a day where you actually focus on the highest thing you want to create. 20 minutes a day where you meditate. 20 minutes a day where you find true peace. Because that 20 minutes, I believe, is the most important 20 minutes. Because it settles your soul down and reminds you of your connection. Let's pray. I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul to the activity of God that is right here, right now. And we put our full focus, our full awareness on God. And we know that all the details, all the drama of our life will be there. But somehow as we put a full focus of our attention on God, on the divine that is within us and all around us, our soul breathes, we're at peace, we're happy. It's actually easy to be us. Holy Spirit, fill us up. Holy Spirit, heal us. Holy Spirit, renew us. Holy Spirit, in all the ways and everything that we need and want and desire most, let us always start with you. That we may be spiritually awake and alive and knowing the glory of God in every day and every moment and every experience. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.